Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. Everybody sit down and relax. This is a lovely, lovely, powerful story. And my guest is Rebecca Barber. Rebecca is a woman very much like a lot of you, my listeners, my, the, and all the readers of Boomer Times. But something happened to her that set her apart now. And now she has a big mission. And I'm going to let you hear from Rebecca because it's a big story. So, Rebecca, I want to thank you for coming on. And I know it all started with your, your class on memoir writing. It did. And tell us really who you are and why now you have a special mission. I'm a first-generation American. That's very, a very big part of who I am. And growing up, I was very much protected. I didn't know of any World War II stories. My mother would occasionally say, Reba, how are you going to be a partisan in the forest if you can't finish your homework? Well, she was a force to be reckoned with, an independent woman, um, a businesswoman, a, a devoted mother, and died very young at the age of... 61 in 1982 where did she live new york city i i knew of her as dynamic and a wonderful personality and a leader but when i found two german written diaries little ones in her night table drawer dated starting in january of 1938 i absolutely was stunned because I couldn't quite make out all of the words. I w- listened to German up until then my whole life um, for, in the household. And it took me 10 years to build up the courage to start having them translated. At first, I went to somebody's, frankly, someone's cleaning lady who was Polish-German. And what she translated was just a mumbo-jumbo I turned to my husband, Sandy. I said, there isn't much here. And he said, no, you're going to keep on going. And in my lap fell Dr. Rabbi Jacob Wiener, a docent at the U.S. Holocaust Museum, because by then I was living in uh, suburban D.C., who took almost eight months to translate my mother's diary. I'll never forget him telling me that my mother wrote with such poetry and such prose that that's probably the reason that a less educated person could put words to it. And I started speaking to schools, to JCCs, just sharing her hope, her courage, her always trust in God and lucky star. And and what was in the diary? Give us some pages. What were some of the ideas that were in them? In the diary, which I do have a few, um, uh, I'm trying, I'm stumbling well, because. No, it's okay, it's pages uh, that uh, were special. Very, very special. And she writes in the beginning, today on January 18th, 1939, I'm beginning to write down all that happened to my life. Now, remember, she had just turned 19 the month before. It has been a life of many changes, never flowing very straight. Now I am standing at the crossroads. This is two months after Kristallnacht. I do not know what will lie ahead. Everything was going very evenly when we lived in Poland. My young years were rather monotonous. When I was seven years old, I emigrated with my parents and siblings to Dusseldorf in Germany. Thereupon, our life was in constant fear and uneasiness regarding our future. God decided to punish us Jews by sending us a second Haman. This is the first paragraph. And when I read this, what what's going to be ahead for her? And she describes ways in which they hid under bridges, crossed um, borders. Uh, she did use her blonde hair and blue eyes um, a number of times uh, to trick guards. She hid her parents, whom she had wrote were quote, conspicuous. The police showed up at their door before they left, 
And um, my grandmother, in a, in a stroke of genius, refused to take what she writes in the diary as bag and baggage. And what happened was she did take her Polish, uh, their Polish passports. And Polish Jews, if you remember at that time, were allowed to go home. Those Jews with German passports were deported and never seen again. So thereafter in the book, my mother refers to thanking God Almighty and her lucky star. And we see my mother's traveling from Dusseldorf. And amazingly enough, she writes in the German diary the steps and the places that she and her family hid, lived, went through. Holland, Belgium, France, about six cities and towns in France, Spain, and finally Portugal, ending in Lisbon, where she herself found a a ship for them to go on. And she, the only thing she would tell me later in life was, I made it across on a banana boat. So where were we going with all of this? Well, three years ago, I received a phone call from a woman asking me, am I Rebecca Steppel? Dykin Barber. Yes, I am. Why are you calling? We believe your mother was the recipient of a visa by a man named Aristides de Sosa Mendez, Portuguese consul in Bordeaux in 1940. Would you please send us any documentation you have? Sure enough, I sent her copies of everything and I did keep quite a bit. And in my mother's passport, She wrote back, without hesitation, your mother was a visa recipient from a man that I had never heard of that she never mentioned. Flash forward two years, and we have the opportunity to travel with other descendants of visa recipients, starting from Bordeaux, ending in Lisbon. And Anita, I have to only tell you that every day was a miracle. Every day was a fascinating find. I was able to stand in the same synagogue that my mother writes of that was too, as she put it, unhygienic for women. But I was invited to someone's house. And in fact, in the back of the diary is an address. And the people of the Sosa Mendez and other uh, participants Scoop me up from the synagogue. We put in our GPS. Where is this place? And it was a five-minute walk from the synagogue. So there we are, reporters in tow, photographers in tow, participants in tow, finding the building that my mother was hidden in. And it was one story after another like that. My guest is Rebecca Barber, and we're going over some very, very poignant and actually remarkable uh, things. What a story this is. So, Rebecca, I, I, I haven't heard anything about your father. When did your mother marry? Yes. Your Interestingly father? enough, when I give my presentation and have given my presentation, one of the things I do say um, very soon on is that it would not be honoring my father if I did not at least mention him. He was a man of another century. Although he was, he was uh, quite a bit older than my mother, he was a rabbi, he was a scholar. His, even though he won a scholarship from Lithuania, which he referred to as White Russia, Kovna, to come to New York to be a student at the Yeshiva University um, and re- received his rabbinate. He did become a diamond cutter and later a diamond dealer, but frankly, Anita, he was happiest when he was reading the Bible, studying uh, the traditions, and uh, listening to the great cantors of the world who had come to America. He, above all, adored my mother. She was the driving force. She was the businesswoman who brought them out of the immigrant status. And he was probably the gentlest soul you could ever meet. And and that's important because, you know, in every family, there are the pushers and they're the Pushies, exactly. pushies and the pushers. Exactly. <laughs> but, uh, okay, I just need to find out about that a little bit. So now, you, I see you have actually written a book in, in a, of all that you've been 
that you were able to capture. And, of course, you told us that you had someone who uh, did all the translation. But this must be very exciting for you inside. I mean, it's probably hard for you to even describe this, isn't it? It it, it really is. When I was invited to speak both at our neighborhood in Valencia Point for a Kristallnacht um, special day and at Spanish River High School, I didn't realize how emotional it would be for me, how much I would have gotten out of it. But the neighborhood was entranced, um, very, very interested, very engaged. And surprisingly, many of them had some of their own stories that they then wanted to tell me about and to also start writing. So that's the snowball effect I'm hoping for just as Monty wants to spread um, the the memoir for our children, for our children's children. Now, of course, you've been to a lot of the Holocaust museums around oh, yes. the country, around the world, yes. and I know the one in Washington is spectacular. Yes. I'm going to ask you this question because I, it's hard for me to understand it. I, I hear it. I can't talk about it. I think sometimes in this particular historical situation, it it universally seems to have to jump a generation. They protected us. My mother wanted to obviously put it aside, put it behind her. Her last entry in the diary is in English, where she is having what is obviously a PTSD um, a episode, post-traumatic episode. People are running after me, she writes. They want the ring I'm wearing. Uh, Everyone hates me because I'm a Jew. So then I come along and it was all about, oh, honey, if you don't want to ride a bike, that's okay. You don't want to swim, that's okay. My friends make fun of it, but now I truly understand what it was she was protecting me from, the near misses that she had for years and years. But I'm all about sharing it, especially with what is happening around us in the United States. I can say never again just so many times, but it has to be shouted with specifics off the rooftops because never again. Right. Uh, And I was just relating some stories that I've had some people who've been authors and who've been in the Holocaust, and and it's hard for them to talk about. Some won't. But then again, I have, and I can't remember her name now, but a woman who brought this lady to live with her when she wrote the memoir for her. And they lived three years, and it's a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, And so many people have these stories. Mm -hmm. That's true. And I think they have been recorded in the the museums. I think a lot of stories have been what what set you there. might find interesting, Anita, is that many years ago, when I did go to the Holocaust Museum and bring these artifacts with me, um, the Holocaust Museum wanted them right away, and I had not translated them or had them translated by then. I didn't know the contents, and they said, "Well, our permanent exhibit has been set. It wasn't open. The museum had not been opened yet." Uh, But we would like to keep these in our archives, and at some future time, we'll bring them out. Anita, I wasn't ready to separate. I knew I had, let's put it, a job to do, a mission. And just recently, I was thinking, well, I know there are Holocaust museums down in Florida. This is my home from now and till forever. Maybe I'll donate them. I have another mission, and that mission hopefully will be accomplished with Monty. Well, I was going to say, because these are this, these are the real artifacts. These are the real artifacts. And they have to be kept locked up. Yes, they do. They have been rare and, to yeah, come out are. of I mean, there. This is really spectacular. Yes. And, and I see that there's a picture of your mother in, you wrote some things. I saw a picture of her. But um, do you have a lot of pictures of your mother? Interestingly enough, a lot of the pictures have gone by the wayside as I've moved and moved. But I held on to this one uh, fabulous old a photo book that meant nothing to me. I see her with uh, writing Palace Hotel, 1940, Curia, Portugal, and then voila. We go on this mission with the Sosa Mendez Foundation, 
and I am not only in Kuria, but I am at the Palace Hotel where my husband Sandy is duplicating the exact pictures that were taken of my mother, taken of me. So I have a lot of respect for the things that I do have, and hopefully this will all be incorporated in a book. Oh, yeah. This this is such a natural. It's, it, is, uh, it is amazing. And so I am so glad that you are part of this memoir uh, writing group. But I think the other thing that, that's very important to me is that now with Ancestry and .com, I mean, I have cousins. I'm not as interested. Isn't that funny? In my ancestors, I just know I'm Hungarian. But some of my cousins are going crazy, and yes. they're they're dry, they're going to Hungary, they're going to Austria, yeah. they're meeting people, and they show the similarities. Yeah. So some people yeah. really have, yeah. You know, now I don't in my life, I never knew about the Holocaust with my family for well, some reason. I don't know if that's even true. I'd like to tell you in regard to that one fantastic story that I hope doesn't take away from the eventual addition to my current um, book. But I also received a call. Uh, approximately four years ago, in a heavy German accent. Hello, I am Hildegard Jacobs, calling from Düsseldorf, and again asking me my name. Are you the daughter of Leah Stapel? Yes, I am. Well, someone dropped your mother's, uh, the English version of the diary, because it's been in print for 20 years, at our museum, which is a memorial museum in Düsseldorf, We are going to do a renovation, and we want to know if you have anything to send us. Well, with Post Haste, I send a bunch of um, copies and uh, different pictures and what have you. But what she gave me in return was amazing. She went to archives. You know the Germans. They kept archives. And I knew my mother to be one of three children, Um, Leah or Otalia, which I didn't know that was her name, Um, Paul and Henny. On the paperwork that this woman found, there was a fourth child, Carolina. Carolina was born with Down syndrome to my grandmother. She was placed in those days, that's what they did, in a, um, uh, I won't call it sanitarium, but it was. She did have a heart defect. My mother never spoke of her. We don't even know if she knew of her, but she passed away in uh, at four years old, which was what year? Um, I'm That's turning the, to my no, husband. Yeah, no. um, because that allowed the nuclear family of my grandparents and the three children to actually escape Germany. They would not have left I am certain of that. Had and this leave her there. Be, and leave her there. Well, that so see, you did find out something, but it yeah. wasn't. It's someone that found you. Yes. And people are doing that, aren't they? Yes. You may be getting other calls that you. And I once hope so. this book comes out, yes, it, you will really be getting a lot yes. of calls, won't you? Yes. So, have you gone on to Ancestry dot com yourself? I, I guess you have so much here. Why yeah. do you need to do that? Well, right? right now, I have to just unravel all the places that my mother was corroborate uh, the locations, um, uh, talk about the other descendants. I mean, I went on with descendants who are world famous, um, and we have been exchanging stories. The very famous Paul Rosenberg, who was the a huge art curator in Paris, sole representation of Picasso, 600 of his gallery was pillaged and his granddaughter was on the voyage and she tells stories so and that's not the only one so now i'm humbled by the world that could have been and the world that was saved i want to just tell you, you've been listening to rebecca barber i'm sure you'll be hearing her more probably you're going to hear her on national npr or somewhere at some point because this is unique and so i was looking at the name of the Book. I'm going to call this a booklet that you put together because it's not a real book, but it's on its way. It's called A Journey for Survival, An Odyssey of Faith and Courage. You're probably going to find a better title. 
uh, I'll work I, on it. Well, and, and I think, and, you know, you, you, have, yeah, you have a real... And Monty re, yeah, can help you me. Do, because Remember, I was it's younger. It's bigger than that. Yeah. You oh, know, it's well, bigger than you. that. I don't know what it is either. Thank but, you. Yeah, but it's... Thank uh, you. M- maybe that's the second part of it. But the okay. first part, it's not called silence with some... But, you know, it's, it's funny. Silence is also... Everything seems like, as Monty said in, in an interview I did with him, silence takes care of a lot of things. Your mother's, your father's, things that you never said. and But Agreed. this is a big silence. Yes, it and is. And so I'm sure that when you saw Schindler's List, you saw that before or after this uncovered? After. After. Yeah. But I still didn't realize the grand now. Exactly. <laughs> right. I didn't realize the grandness of my mother's writing, of her poetry, and her deep, deep faith that they will survive. Right. It's hard to believe, isn't it, when Very. you think about what but but thank goodness we do have so many movies that have been made yes. that uh, that you can go along so you're uh you have you know it's funny i'm sure it sounds like you came down i don't know what you did before were you in a professional in some way yes you were many ways in many ways <laughs> i was in a business with my mother for 15 years i was well, an that's academian really special you I, were in a business yeah, with your mother i was we spoke every single day for 15 years on. Which even makes this more outrageous, right, doesn't it? Right, right, <laughs> Okay, Many. and, and you, so you were in, you also, you said you were a teacher? What did yes, you say? Yes, I, I was an adult trainer, a teacher for a few years in the beginning, but I was an adult, certified adult training specialist, and I was the first one to train seniors, if you can believe it, in 1990-something uh, on uh, through the NIH, because, again, I lived in Maryland, uh, to see if they would be interested in, in getting involved with the thing called the World Wide Web. And I taught <laughs> seniors, which at that time was so far away from me, um, to um, search the Internet uh, for medical purposes. Well, the rest is history. <laughs> right. So I have some very interesting Well, so things. the reason I mentioned that is because now when you came down here, you probably thought, okay, I'm going to relax. I'm going to just play tennis and I'm going to swim and... That's and right. we're going to go on vacation. That's right. Forget it. That's right. <laughs> See, you know, when men, especially I've done this with a lot of men, they come down. I'm going to come down and play play golf or play tennis. And, of course, I know what their history is. I said, there is no way. There is right. no way that you can do that. You can't take what you have. Maybe you'll do it for a couple of years. Well, I, I, right. I'm, I'm going to try very hard to balance friends and family mm-hmm. work, which I will call this research, and play. I'm going to try that because life is short and I want to get it all in. Yes, yeah, it, you know, it is short, but you look like you're doing very well, and I, I think that this is going to go somewhere because you have a great hero to, to help you, a mentor, let's call That's him a, right. a hero mentor. Yes. And he's going to help you as well as he has his own also to do. We have to help him get his movie going, too, Absolutely. because Silence has to be a movie with John McKenzie. And yes. so, but you have someone who's real. His, his hero is made up, but your heroine is not made up. No, she's and, not. Uh, and tell me what her name was again. It well, was I never did know Leah that it was is, Otalia, yeah, Leah Otalia. Steppel, but we only knew her as Leah. And when I saw her um, passport for the first time, I said, okay, Ma, I guess that's your name. So I've been referring to her a lot as Otalia. Well, and um, how, see, and where did she live when, when in her last years? Here? New York. Uh-huh. Always in New York. She made her way. Uh, from uh, Portugal, from Lisbon, and then stayed in New York, building a business, marrying my father. Did she speak Spanish? Oh, my no, mother or, spoke five languages by the time she got to the I States. Said Portugal would not be Spanish. Uh, that would, right, right, Portuguese. Right. My mother wound up, uh, in the book she talks about being a regular professor. Mind you, she was 21 because she taught languages to both men and children. She was speaking, I don't know where she picked it up, where... Her talent was, but she spoke five languages. Well, anyone who would write, and I'm privileged to look at the diaries, even though they're in German, but her handwriting was perfect. Yes. It was beautiful. Yes. And she, yes, I mean, everything, of course, you know, as I said, I don't read German, but it's interesting. I'm seeing the handwriting. Do you know today I have triplet grandchildren? They're 11, and they don't, they don't teach them in school cursive writing. Do you know that? And not only do I know that it, but I've so witnessed it. bad. I, when I look at her, this is all cursive. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, look okay. at her handwriting. Steady. It's Yeah, it's yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, at least you had at least you knew your mother. That's the other thing I was going to say. So many people have heard about their relatives and never had the privilege of knowing them. That's right. And so you not only knew her but you were in business with her. Yes. So what do you think if you could stretch 5 years from now? That's just what what would be your hopes and dreams for this? What do you think is going to happen? Although it's a question you're asking me for the first time, I have thought about it. Okay. And my husband knows that this is how I feel. Okay. I believe that middle school, especially for the main part of the book, because she was a young girl, um, it should be in the middle school curriculum. There is a young lady right now, um, I forget her name, um, I, where I spoke at um, the Spanish River, who says that so many of her contemporaries, uh, Dana well, what, Weinstein, what? she is bringing Holocaust information uh. into your schools, our school system here. And so I would like it to be part of the curriculum. I would like it to, again, my mission is let's not forget. Okay. And let's know it can, it can repeat. So I want to get it to a wider audience. We'll be audience. hearing from you again, Rebecca. I know that. Thank you so much. Thank you.